Okay, so uh, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to our presentation. My name is Jakub Pavlík and I am uh, director of engineering at Volterra and I am responsible for uh, leading the SARI team. Great, thanks Jakub. Uh, my name is Sandeep Pombra and I'm the head of data science and I'm responsible for doing all the machine learning, data science and uh, uh, data modeling at uh, Volterra. Okay, so today uh, we are excited to uh, get our session to KubeCon and we would like to share with you our story and journey, how we get to the scaling to the million machine learning models and uh, how we are using Kubernetes, Apache Spark and Apache Arrow to uh, work with all those data and what uh, great features we are able to uh, get from them. So a little bit about agenda. Uh, first of all, uh, I will take you through a quick overview of what is Volterra because uh, not everybody probably is uh, familiar with what we are doing. Then Sandeep will explain our machine learning functions and uh, our model explosion uh, and the problems what uh, we were facing. Then uh, I will take you through machine learning infrastructure evolution journey and how we uh, continuously improve our uh, large infrastructure. And then Sandeep will take you through all model scaling uh, challenges. Now, uh, to begin with, I uh, pick up this slide. Uh, don't worry, it is not uh, so much vendor stuff, uh, but I wanted to show you what is basically behind. So we at the Volterra, we build uh, distributed cloud services wherever your apps and data need them. So it can be public cloud, uh, it can be private cloud, physical edge, nomadic edge, or our uh, global backbone. We focus on uh, providing uh, distributed uh, network services and distributed infrastructure for the application. So this is how it looks our uh, normal slide, but from the, our engineering side and what you can see the behind and what is running. So for us, it is basically Kubernetes everywhere and all those locations and all those sites means um, Kubernetes, site, the Kubernetes sites. And it also means a lot of logs and metrics and data, which we are able to pull from and then analyze them and uh, provide uh, great features for our customers and also for us to be able to operate. Okay, uh, thanks Jakub. So I'm going to talk a little bit about our machine learning applications. Um, as Jakub described, you know, we have a very complex uh, distributed microservices, multi-cloud environment. And this uh, entails a lot of different machine learning functions. Uh, first of all, we need to provide a very sophisticated uh, web application firewall function. And uh, typical rule-based WAFs uh, are not sophisticated enough uh, to handle zero, uh, zero day attacks. Um, so we need to provide uh, the most uh, you know, sophisticated machine learning algorithms that allow us to handle that. Uh, besides that's an important part of an application for us is understanding how the APIs within the application are working. Uh, so we use machine learning to, to discover our APIs and basically uh, compress the whole um, you know, application into a, a bunch of different API endpoints. Um, then we uh, do a lot of uh, different types of anomaly detection uh, to again uh, detect bot attacks and different types of uh, DDoS attacks. Uh, we do time series anomaly detection and we also do per request anomaly detection. And we also do um, user behavior analysis uh, to understand if there's any malicious users as well as to understand the application better. Um, so as you can see from this picture, uh, there is a lot of different types of machine learning functions. They are divided between uh, the learning core, which is the training and, um, and the inference engines, which run on the edge. And um, the learning core actually is a global um, learning area where we uh, do all our training. And as you will see um, in the next few slides that uh, to do this, we have to uh, ma um, really manage a very massive scale. Uh, so we'll uh, talk about this more um, as we go forward. Okay, so before we uh, get to uh, external models, let me explain you uh, 
the scale and how we collect metrics and logs in our infrastructure. So we have uh, three type of sites. We have a uh, custom edges, which are available in thousands, right? So there can be thousands, hundreds of thousands of the sites. Then we have something what we call regional edges, which are our point of presence and our global backbone. Those are tens today. And then we have a global controller, uh, which is today distributed across three regions. And this is the place where we are doing uh, uh, data analysis. So the way how it works is that we have a Prometheus in each of every site, which scrapes uh, local Kubernetes workload as well as nodes. And then we are doing from the connected regional edges uh, Prometheus Federation with the uh, metrics white listings. And we are scraping only certain metrics which we are particularly interested in and which we want to work with. So not basically everything. And we use a remote write, which gets write data into Cortex as our long-term storage for uh, all those kind of metrics. Uh, regional Edge Prometheus is Prometei also send alerts and produce alerts to, to our uh, alert manager. On the log side, uh, today we are using Fluentbit who uh, captures all the log messages from our services and from the third party services. They are forwarded to uh, aggregation FluentD and Fluentbit's uh, uh, demons in the pops and regional edges. And from there, we write into two places today. So we write into uh, Elasticsearch and we also write into uh, AWS S3. And those APIs are then available for our uh, metric data analysis, uh, even data analysis and other services which Sandeep will be uh, uh, explaining on the uh, future slides. Yeah, so um, as Jakub uh, just uh, showed that we have a very complex uh, architecture with a lot of different types of data ingestion. And we also have, when we are deploying applications, we are typically deploying very complex applications. And these applications uh, uh, basically under, under, underlying these applications are a lot of different dimensions. Um, basically we have application, virtual host, source sites, destination sites. And uh, one of the things we found when we're doing all our machine learning modeling is that every application, every customer, every uh, geography has its own characteristics. Uh, so it's very difficult to uh, um, develop a universal model for all of these. Uh, so basically to get the best performance in terms of our machine learning accuracy, we have to develop models for each across each of the dimension. And as you can see, uh, basically doing that kind of a combination uh, just by a multiplicative logic leads to a very large cardinality of models. And in our case, um, uh, we were looking at in uh, certain cases, some of the models, uh, for example, for the time series, uh, we're getting into millions of time series. Um, so basically we need to uh, figure out a way to scale these models. Um, so initially when we started this project, um, you know, obviously we were trying to get the machine learning and our algorithms working. Uh, so we were running these models on a single instance in a serialized manner. And what that did was basically it took a very long time to run. And uh, obviously, you know, when we are training and uh, doing inference and scoring based on these models, if the model takes several hours to run, um, the, the, the model itself becomes obsolete. And definitely it's not something that was sustainable. Uh, so um, now Jakub is gonna talk about a little bit about how our infrastructure was also uh, struggling to meet this need. So <clears throat> when we started, uh... Uh, we actually, uh, and this is the infrastructure uh, picture, uh, which is looking now on the global controller as I introduced in the previous slide. So we started with the uh, more regions, but this picture covered one of the region where we provided uh, Elasticsearch, Cortex and um, AWS S3 API, and we run everything as an EKS uh, cluster. In the, inside of the EKS cluster. And it was basically a single cluster running continuous uh, uh, learning jobs. And the issue was uh, that uh, parallelism and also 
uh, inefficient uh, CPU, uh, RAM usage. And uh, uh, we, the issue was that we had to resize to bigger and bigger uh, VMs and flavors. And uh, it was not quite efficient because some uh, because those jobs running few hours and then then they don't run many hours so you need to find kind of balance so it was not really uh, cost efficient and resources efficient and uh, therefore we wanted to find a different way or take a look on the different perspective how we can handle this very large data sets uh, ingestion uh, and the training Yeah. So, um, so as Yakub mentioned, you know, we were uh, coming uh, running into a lot of bottlenecks in our infrastructure. Uh, so, obviously, you know, uh, from a machine learning a model scaling, uh, the obvious approach is to run several models in parallel. And you know, this can be done in various ways. Uh, you know, we could use Dask or Joblib or a variety of Python because most of our code was in Python. Uh, but we want something which was much more easier to maintain, easier to scale, easier to manage. Uh, so we wanted to combine uh, the best of scaling, horizontal scaling, as well as having the ability to auto scale, scale to different customers, uh, do automation as uh, Yakub mentioned with CICD and minimize the infrastructure management. And we also wanted to be able to have a very um, universal way of uh, our data ingestion so that we could easily do secure and seamless data ingestion. Uh, so for all these reasons, uh, we decided that we wanted to, um, it's, um, I think it's not allowing me to go to the oh, next slide. Um, okay, there it is. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so basically to do this, we wanted to combine the best of uh, Spark scaling and parallelization and Kubernetes infrastructure. So we use Spark uh, basically as a horizontal scaling and uh, Kubernetes as a distributed uh, data ingestion architecture with uh, integrated CI CD. Um, so uh, we wanted to have a faster time to market. Uh, so rather than uh, creating our own uh, open source Spark engine, uh, we decided to leverage uh, the SaaS technology from uh, Databricks. Yes, so uh, when we start, uh, let me talk about a little bit about how we actually integrated Databricks and uh, uh, what we had to do. So if you look at the standard Databricks uh, integration, basically they uh, calculate that you will give them access to the full uh, AWS VPC and they can provision the VMs and jobs as they need. And you do AWS peering with your uh, VPC where you have uh, your data, in our case, our global control with Cortex, uh, Prometheus, and Elasticsearch API. So the, pro uh, the problem what we find here was that we didn't want to give them access to uh, our VPC, so we created dedicated instance, uh, dedicated account, but we still didn't want to use just the peering because uh, we wanted to have a visibility on what is flowing, set detailed firewall rules, and uh, make sure that uh, it cannot get breached and they cannot access our core infrastructure uh, and they don't uh, they don't use our uh, CAs and our certificates. So we wanted to really uh, isolate them and uh, VPC peering was not uh, good enough. So we come up with the idea that we can actually leverage our own technology and uh, make it better. And therefore we worked with this design. So we took, we let run our EKS and our existing VPC as is, and we just created a dedicated account uh, for Databricks learning jobs. And then we launched our uh, ingress, egress gateway uh, called Vault Mesh, which basically allow us to get connectivity for only particular API, uh, which we need. Uh, in this case, it's a Prometheus, uh, Cortex, and Elasticsearch. 
and we just advertise only those APIs with uh, uh, different certificates and the different uh, authority for the data breaks, which allow us to really provide granular to API uh, filtering and service policies and allows to Volterra Learning Services such as API discovery, time series anomaly detection, per request anomaly detection, request data analysis or user behavior analysis to run and consume and produce metrics back to our infrastructure without any uh, security breaching or direct access to core Volterra services. And of course, this help us also to improve our own technology. Okay, great. Thanks, Jakub. So um, now I think the rest of the talk, I will focus on how we use Spark to parallelize our models. And uh, basically, um, sorry, I can go to the previous slide. Yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, the way Spark works is, you know, Spark relies very much on running the functions on the driver itself and then uh, running a, a bunch of executors in parallel. And uh, typically that can be done by creating either data frames or um, RDDs, which are resilient distributed data sets, uh, which are collection of data uh, frames or data modules that run on different executors. So the idea is basically, um, you know, you take some um, huge uh, data and then you split it into uh, different executors. And actually, if your executors are multi-core, you can even go and split them into multi-core. So for example, if we have four executors uh, with four cores, so we could parallelize by a factor of 16. Uh, so the first approach we took uh, was for the kinds of scaling where basically we were going to ingest the data and we were going to also uh, ingest the models um, into the various interfaces that uh, Jakub talked about. And for that, uh, we came up with a very simple scheme where basically we took our dimensions like applications, namespaces, and uh, created uh, uh, what we call is a, you know, a pandas data frame out of it. And uh, then uh, we did, uh, you converted that data frame into an RDD. And then uh, basically what we can do is do a map, which is basically applying any function allows us to run a function. Uh, obviously the input output of this is more symbolic where basically we want to make sure that um, your um, function is executed, uh, but the actual uh, core functionality uh, can be very complicated. Um, so if you look at this um, quotes and snippet, um, I can um, basically explain a little bit further how we did this. Um, so basically uh, Spark has um, two kinds of operations. There is the transformations like the map and which is apply of a function. And then there is basically actions which actually execute the thing uh, like collect um, or count and things like that or other kinds of aggregations. Um, so in this case, you can see um, if um, we define this outer function, uh, which is basically a standard Python function, uh, we get our um, pandas frame, which has all the keys uh, that we're going to use for mapping. Uh, we create a, a, a Spark data frame uh, based on the Panda frame. And uh, then basically uh, we make sure that we um, uh, have the, the actual uh, mapping function which is embedded within this function. So we can uh, use any of these variables like variable one, variable two inside this function. And these will be automatically uh, exported uh, to each of the executors. And uh, so pretty much this function is uh, we, uh, we take the data frame, we map, uh, we convert into RDD and we map this function. Uh, this, this, the, therefore it applies this function to every row of this RDD, which is the original Panda frame. And, uh, and then we do a collection to make sure that this function is actually executed because a Spark has a lazy execution where it will only execute the function when they actually do the collect thing. Uh, but one thing I wanted to point out is that this model function, which I have not really uh, talked to, uh, described here can be a very complicated function uh, and we can pass a lot of different types of objects to it uh, without any problem. And this will all be done seamlessly. And this automatically uh, scales the, the, the function into ver various parallel um, components. Um, so this is actually a very cool approach and this works very well in scaling when you know, we do everything within the function. Uh, 
but there are other instances uh, where basically we have a much more complicated data frame. Uh, sorry, let me see, how do I go to the next slide here? Jakob, could you, go, could you go to the next slide? I'm not able to do that for some reason. Uh, can you go to the next slide? Oh. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, so there is a, a lot of situations where basically our data set is already available. It's, it's a complex data frame and not every single column within the data set is, are the keys. There's a lot of actual data. Uh, there's also things where we want to actually, um, you know, get data out of our functions, which are much more sophisticated. Uh, so uh, we cannot use that simple approach in that case. And in that case, what we have to do is we have to come up with a different approach. And we decided to use an approach uh, which uses a conjunction of Pandas UDF uh, with Apache Arrow. And we'll talk about Apache Arrow um, in the next slide, but basically the idea is uh, UDFs basically means a user-defined function. And uh, typically in Python, uh, when you do Python UDFs, uh, that is uh, basically takes every uh, row of the data frame and converts and runs a function every row. And that's, that's very inefficient. Uh, so we wanted to use Pandas UDFs, which actually work in a much more vectorized fashion and uh, can increase the performance by up to 100 times on, on Python UDFs. And obviously, since uh, we are going to do our models across a lot of different dimensions, uh, we want to use something called a group map, Pandas UDFs, uh, which allow us to um, take a, you know, a group by approach uh, to split, apply, combine these uh, UDFs and uh, do these functions uh, in a much more uh, seamless fashion. Um, so um, I'll talk a little bit more about Apache Arrow. Um, yeah, so, um, so when we uh, do this kind of um, uh, go from like, you know, basically Spark, which is running in uh, like a Java virtual machine and go into a Python Pandas API, uh, there's a lot of serialization involved uh, if you don't use any, uh, Apache Arrow, and that serialization can take a lot of time and it's very inefficient uh, because it works row by row. Uh, but with Apache Arrow, uh, we can use a columnar uh, way to, uh, to basically send this data from uh, Spark to, uh, to Python API and uh, to a Pandas API. And this columnar is, uh, data is very efficient because it takes advantage of all um, the, the SIMD architecture of all our, the modern CPUs. And this allows a very efficient way to, uh, to get this data in a very vectorized fashion uh, from, uh, from basically the Spark data frame uh, to the Pandas API. And uh, so this is essential in uh, getting the performance and the cost reduction that we need. Um, so I will um, uh, talk a little bit more about the, the, the group Pandas a API. Um, so as I said, you know, basically the idea is we have an original data frame, uh, which is consists of all our data and a bunch of keys. And we use those keys to group uh, these data frames into uh, different um, groups. And these groups then go into a pandas function and the function is applied to each group separately. And then the result of these groups is a, a pandas output. Uh, and that allows us uh, to get basically a very efficient way to do uh, this, uh, this function. So basically the idea is uh, we are kind of doing the Python function as a Python API. Uh, but we are using uh, these underlying technologies like Apache Arrow and Pandas UDF to do it in a very efficient and a very parallel fashion. Um, so uh, what I'll do is I will go through a, a code snippet that actually uh, explains how, how we do this uh, in a much, little more detail. Uh, so uh, basically, if you look at this Python code, um, there is a very, it's a very simple um, instance of how to run uh, several uh, models of a random forest, um, scikit-learn random forest regressor in parallel. Uh, so that would be a good example of some of the models we use. Uh, so the way we do that is first we define a schema uh, which basically defines what, what kind of output we are going to have. In this case, we are doing something very simple. Uh, we have basically our group ID, which is the key we uh, do the parallelization by. And then we have the model string, which basically just uh, gives you the model uh, uh, file name. Uh, but this, this schema can be very complicated and we can do uh, you know, a complete Pandas data frame with all of different types of uh, uh, objects in it uh, to really uh, return a very, uh, you know, very uh, a complete data frame. Uh, so in this case, um, you know, we have to use a decorator uh, to, to basically instantiate this Pandas UDF uh, and we are doing a group map UDF. 
Uh, so once we do that, then everything else is pretty straightforward. This is your a regular uh, Python function uh, that basically has a, a pandas uh, data frame as an input. Uh, the group ID is basically something we pass as part of this data frame, and that allows us to identify uh, this specific group. And then, um, you know, within the data frame, we can have a lot of different columns. And in this case, we have three columns, uh, which has the two features and the label. And so by extracting those columns, uh, we can run the random forest regressor uh, on it. And then we basically can do a pickle uh, dump of the model. And we can basically pass the, the model and the group ID back. And this way, uh, this whole function runs in parallel um, across several executors. Um, and the way uh, we instantiate this function is first, we basically enable arrows. So the serialization is, uh, is very fast and is vectorized. Uh, then we have our original pandas data frame that contains the actual data. We convert that into a Spark data frame. And then we apply the, the group by um, model on it. I'm sorry, group by pandas UDF on it. And then once we apply this, as, as I mentioned before, Spark has lazy execution. Uh, so we have to convert this back to pandas and this way we get our results back. Um, so it's a really simple way uh, with just using underlying Python functions and doing parallelization Spark uh, without getting into too much of the nitty gritty of, um, of Spark. Uh, so this actually uh, demonstrates you know, the two ways we have parallelized and been able to scale our models um, to this, um, this level. Uh, so, so that actually concludes um, our presentation. Uh, we have a few uh, concluding remarks. We can talk about those. Um, so basically, you know, uh, we presented a, a, a way to take the best of Kubernetes and best of Spark uh, to do a scaling with end-to-end -end automation and security and CI/CD uh, uh, to basically productize our models and scale them uh, to a very high cardinality. Uh, we used a very unique architecture as Jakub uh, described. Uh, it's very unique because we're embedding Spark into a microservice within Kubernetes. I think this is uh, very novel, but, uh, but, very, but very simple. Uh, uh, so obviously, you know, the one advantage we have with Spark as Jakub mentioned was, you know, when we run these models, uh, we can run them as basically uh, clusters that we create and uh, uh, terminate once the, the actual uh, job or the training is over, uh, that way we save a lot of resource courses, I'm sorry, resource costs. And then um, as we uh, evolve with more models and more applications, it's very easy for us to integrate those into, into our current infrastructure. And now, um, you know, in terms of scaling, uh, we're also looking at other dimensions of scalings uh, that we can do with it, within this architecture, uh, which is beyond uh, just the, the models itself. Uh, we are looking at, you know, when an application is very big and has a lot of different uh, complexity, we can basically scale within the application uh, with the data itself. And then we're also looking at some very sophisticated uh, deep learning models, which, you know, which tend to be very complex. And we're looking at how we can leverage this architecture to even uh, scale within those mod models and parallelize those models. Uh, so those are some of the things we are going to be doing in the, in the future. Great, thank you. Okay, uh, thanks Sandeep, thanks, uh, thank you. Uh, that's all from our side.